it's three o'clock. I think we're going to get going. I don't have a lot to say right now, except thank you so much, everybody, for being here for the Digital Matters Spring 2023 Research Talk. We have really exciting projects to hear about, and so I'm going to let them go ahead and take it away. We are being recorded today, and this will be available on the Digital Matters YouTube page. Um, we're going to hear from all five of them about 10 minutes each, and then she'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So join me in welcoming our presenters for today. Hello, everybody. Can everyone hear me all right? Excellent. All right, so welcome. Uh, my name is Alan McCormick, and as a special collections cataloger, I create and remediate metadata for a variety of materials here in the library, uh, particularly our rare books and archival holdings. Today, I'll be discussing a project made possible by a Digital Matters Lab faculty grant, uh, wherein a student worker and I enhance the metadata for a selection of archival collections containing materials by and about BIPOC and religious minority groups. There we go. Uh, but before we get started, let's define our terms. I found that scholarly communities use these words very differently. Uh, so I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Uh, firstly, what is an archive? Um, in library and information science, an archive is an accumulation of historical records, especially unpublished materials, that are created naturally over the course um, of a person or organization's lifetime. My personal archive, for example, might include grocery store receipts, email, holiday cards, cell phone photos, and all the other stuff I create uh, and receive just living my life. And this is something different than the archive, theorized by researchers in other disciplines. A hypothetical wonderland, as Michelle Caswell says, containing everything that was or could have been written or said or created. Humanities researchers in particular often focus on reconstructing information missing from the archive. Um, librarians and archivists know that it's really never been possible to save everything. Special collections, of course, is the part of the library that contains materials which are rare, historic, unique, or valuable in some way. They often contain archives and archival materials, but the terms are not synonymous. Uh, finally, cataloging, as I alluded to earlier, and what is my primary responsibility here in the library, um, is a library science term for creating metadata or data about data for information resources. It involves describing the resource, choosing access points, conducting subject analysis, and other functions so that the resulting records are discoverable in library catalogs and other databases. This allows library patrons and others um, to find connections between similar or related materials. Without metadata, no one can find the amazing books, archival collections, and other resources we own. Archives in particular must be processed, cataloged, and otherwise interpreted by archivists and librarians before they're able to be used by the public. If you've ever had to help someone declutter their home, you have an understanding of the kind of work that's involved here. Until you have an honest accounting of everything in, say, your mother's basement, uh, you really can only guess at the hidden treasures uh, within the closets, boxes, and uh, random piles scattered throughout the space. It's also both necessary and good to discard all of the superfluous material, like perhaps stacks of unused envelopes or plastic bags full of rubber bands, uh, as you make sense of the materials. And the same is true for archives. Archivists and librarians are the trained professionals who make sense of the documents and facilitate the scholarly use. Without this labor, you just have a pile of unparsable stuff to be played. Um, while metadata creation in general can be fraught, archival metadata in particular has some unique concerns. Firstly, predominantly white institutions haven't always handled the materials of minoritized groups with sensitivity. This might include using outdated racial or religious terminology to describe groups, or allowing these materials to languish in backlogs because their importance isn't well understood. Large collections in particular, such as the massive oral history collections we have here at the Marriott Library, can obscure the presence of minoritized communities. Catalogers can't possibly provide access points for every single aspect of the collection. Um, the resulting metadata would be so lengthy as to be unreadable for patrons. But we have to select grouping terms, summarize, and otherwise condense our efforts. This often means that, minority, that majority groups are represented in metadata and minoritized groups are not. Uh, language itself can also be tricky as it's constantly changing. 
a once neutral term for an ethnic group may become pejorative over time, causing harm to patrons who see these terms throughout catalog records. Even though librarians and archivists know about these issues, remediation projects can't always be prioritized. Instead, we focus on eliminating processing backlogs as a security measure. Um, undescribed materials can so easily go missing uh, with no one the wiser if they're not described, uh, and to appease donors who've given significant funding and material donations. The sheer size of the archive can also give us pause. With over 4,500 archival collections in the Marriott Library Special Collections, where do we even begin a remediation project? Uh, thankfully, the Digital Matters Lab grant I received allowed me to hire a student worker, Emma Fox, um, who could not be here with me today, to prioritize this work. Prior to Emma's start, I created an initial set of 60 records that we'd focus on remediating. I chose mostly collections that had been partially or fully digitized and were available in our digital library. It really helps beginning catalogers to see the items they're describing as they learn how the material formats are reflected in controlled vocabulary terms. Early on, I decided to exclude eight Native American archives from this original list. These are especially problematic. Um, for example, some interviewees might discuss sacred rituals, not really understanding that those interviews will be made public. Um, and I believe that an expert in indigenous materials really needs to be the one to assist with those. I designed a multi-part training regimen for Emma. First, she took a Library Juice Academy course in subject cataloging, which is often the most difficult part of metadata creation. And she was also given an archival theory and practice reading list. Finally, I sat with her to work through archival records step-by-step, step, explaining each aspect of the record and reviewing all her work in detail. Training someone new to catalog is an incredibly time-intensive endeavor, and there are no shortcuts. Uh, this slide contains images from some of the digitized photograph collections to give you a sense of the many communities represented in this record set. And while the project is still ongoing, we've seen some amazing results so far. Uh, as of April 12th, which is the latest date for which I pulled data, uh, 60 records have been remediated. These represent one audiovisual, 23 photographs, and 36 manuscript collections. Uh, 80 of these had no pre existing record in Alma, which is our online library catalog management system. And two had no previous record in OCLC, which is the database that powers on the International Database WorldCat, which many of you might be familiar with. This means that none of those records could be discovered in the very databases we know patrons rely on the most. And while all of our archival finding aids are available in Archives West, um, which is a separate regional archival database, most of our students and researchers outside of the Mountain West area um, really aren't aware of its existence, and they begin their searches elsewhere. We've also added an abundance of access points to these records. These are the controlled fields that allow patrons to search and explore in an organized and consistent fashion. In the library catalog, these are the record fields that would be hyperlinked and allow patrons to click to find related items across the catalog. Uh, for example, uh, the original records averaged 0.65 per reader terms, while the edited records averaged 1.7. This is an increase of 162%. The original records also contained an average of 3.4 subject headings, while the edited records mean an average of 13.8, which is an increase of 306%. These controlled vocabulary terms augment and enhance existing metadata and finding aids, such as content notes and box and folder listings, which are created by archivists. And they allow researchers to search for or select one predetermined word or string for a topic or person and know that they're seeing all the relevant data. This is especially important when, for example, organizations can use acronyms or their full names, depending on uh, what they want to communicate. People may use their legal names or nicknames, depending on social context. Uh, and the English language has so many synonyms and homonyms that can cause confusion while searching. Uh, if you're looking for a canine, do you mean a tooth or a dog? Context really matters. Uh, controlled vocabulary terms eliminate this uncertainty by providing a single authorized way for patrons to find information. The remediated collections also span a wide variety of identity groups, including the Japanese, Chinese, Black, Middle Eastern, Latinx, Jewish, Buddhist, and Baha'i communities. You can see from this graph that Japanese American collections make up the majority of those edited so far. This doesn't necessarily mean that Japanese materials make up a proportional percentage of the archive. As I mentioned earlier, I had Emma focus on digitized materials first. Um, and many other Japanese archives were digitized for inclusion in an online exhibition, so I think they may be overrepresented in the online materials. 
Um, but this might also show the effect of active outreach to community groups. Um, the relationship uh, that we have with the Japanese American community leaders and civic organizations goes back decades. Um, and those connections have encouraged donations from other members of these groups. So as the grant period wraps up over the next month, there are a few additional things I hope to accomplish. At uh, first, I'll be enrolling in a Python for Librarians course in May. Um, which will allow me to undertake a more targeted collection analysis and maybe make some dash changes instead of having to review each collection individually, uh, which does take quite a bit of time. Emmett and I also hope to remediate some additional records as there are about 30 remaining on the latest spreadsheet that we cultivated. I also plan to collect some final end of project statistics, such as more detailed information on the racial, ethnic, and religious groups included in the remediation project. Longer term goals include quantifying the impact of remediation. For example, monitoring usage statistics to determine if archival collections that have received a data record are used more by patrons and researchers. I'll also be exploring ways to codify data visualization for this work into a new visual language for archival metadata, allowing these complex topics to be communicated more simply and effectively. Uh, finally, Emma and I will be presenting updated results at the Utah Library Association Conference on May 18th. I hope that some of you will be able to see us there. Uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions later today. Thank you. Hey, um, well, welcome. Thank you all for being here. I see some familiar faces. Um, so thank you to my colleagues in the College of Architecture and Planning for being here. Um, I'm really excited to share my work with you guys. Um, so my name is Lori Larson. I'm a student in the College of Architecture and Planning, pursuing my master's in architecture. Um, my background is in visual arts and animation, um, a lot of sculpture, but mostly visual arts lots. Um, and I started pursuing design and architecture last few years. This is a change. Um, my project is a symbolic artwork that I've been calling Brine. Um, my project looks at site-specific adaptation of the Great Salt Lake through physical fabrication and morphological assemblage. <laughs> Try the wheel. The wheel looks for the wheel. Is it me? And <laughs> Um, for the sake of this presentation, um, I'm using just two authors to claim the work. The first is Jane Bennett. Um, her theory works to challenge the idea of matter as a passive and inert substance. Um, she asserts that matter has an inherent vitality and agency that influences human actions and behaviors and bodies and um, moods, as well as obviously everything non-human. Um, but a lot of her theory is aimed towards um, dismantling anthropocentrism. And one of the ways that she does that is to highlight, um, uh, to focus on assemblage as a way to highlight the interconnectedness of uh, causality and agency. So she says, assemblages are living, throbbing confederations that are able to function despite their persistent presence of energies that confound them. So the move here is to distribute agency into these different proto bodies and bodies and materials, um, not just in like a macroorganism like ourselves. Um, and the other author is the R.C. Wentworth Thompson, who is a mathematician and biologist. Uh, he believed that math and physics describe the underlying laws that shape life. Uh, he was working in the late 1800s and uh, early 1900s, about a half a century in each. Uh, so he lived a good long life. Um, but the, the common theory um, for like describing the shape of life um, was competition, uh, natural selection, um, uh, things like that. So the idea of uh, describing life in terms of mathematics is pretty radical. Um, but that's not the reason I included him in my talk today. Um, the reason I thought he was important to include was how he talks about form. Um, he says, in short, the form of an object is a diagram of forces. So for me, um, I work a lot at the intersections of art and biology and design. 
And so thinking about like organisms, um, the shape of them, the form of them, um, is not something that's uh, superficial, but as a way that you can understand, as an avenue to understand um, the forces of a system acting on an organism. That is really compelling to me. Um, so, um, at a really high level, uh, this diagram shows um, the general like organizing principle for the project. Again, this is a symbolic artwork. Uh, and it is composed of these two pieces, a central sort of goal um, that explores digital fabrication through um, morphological assemblage. Um, for this piece, I studied a, a set of organisms in depth looking at how they're adapted to the high saline environment of the Great Salt Lake, how they deal with like the UV radiation, um, tactics of growth, um, and uh, tactics for collaboration as well. And um, through this research, I developed um, a small sculpture that I'll go into in depth later. Um, and then on the left here, um, this is the larger context, which I use the shorthand of uh, firm for. Uh, this is a large scale ceramic sculpture that sits on the floor. Um, and it deals with topics of biomineralization and shallow saline water. So, really, just like the larger context of the Great Salt Lake. Um, a couple uh, key formations in the lake served as my jumping off point. These formations were the oolites and the Great Salt Lake bioharms. Um, and to be brief, uh, a lot of concepts I drew from these was this idea of layering, radial composition, and aggregate and precipitated calcium carbonate. So there's a material aspect as well as um, just a large scale uh, compositional idea. So this slide details a uh, process for designing um, the firm. Again, these uh, concepts I described earlier, the layering, the real composition, these resulted in um, this concept drawing, which I would actually love to pass around. I've got an interactive component, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I developed this first concept drawing, uh, which is sort of this layered mass that's pulled apart to reveal sort of this seed that the, the what I require in the real system. Um, and I like the drawing, and I pursued that into the development of these maquettes, these clay maquettes that you see there. And I brought a few of them, so please do take a look. Um, and through the maquettes, I explored um, the form that I described in the drawing. I explored uh, texture, clay bodies, um, as well as tactics for like where the nucleus would sit, whether it sits on this big mass or whether it's contained in a bowl with maybe like some soft sculpture. Um, but ultimately, like when I had these things made and I put them on the floor like I would the final, um, I sort of felt like they felt really isolated and bowl like um, and object like. Uh, they were also reading very like uh, oyster and coral, like nest and egg mother and child, um, and also a little bit too literal to the um, source material with the bio arms and the legs. So I sort of took a step back and like reevaluated how this sculpture could sort of like lead out into the floor play a little bit more and become a little bit more engaged. Um, and so I started drawing on some of the other work that I've been doing, mainly these two paintings, um, which, uh, the things I was mostly looking at there were the voids, the graphic primitive shapes, um, but mostly like how they were both operating in section. Uh, so the painting here with the figures, uh, that's a split apple. And then the one next to it is like this fictional organism that's cut into sections to share the radiation. Um, so both of these were operating in section. And then I took another look at um, this maquette. And um, thinking about like these radial layers uh, in the same concept of, of section and looking at it like a section of blue light, um, but how that section was working in plan in the sculpture, uh, which kind of gave me my next move, which was sort of like to sink this sculpture into the ground 
so that um, all these divot, divots would kind of extend down beyond the floor plane to suggest that there's something else happening below. Um, so there's a couple other uh, influences, uh, sections of relevance and uh, wave diagrams, things like that, that help me develop uh, the scaffolding that you see up there. Um, and then on that scaffolding, I kind of started to design some voids and then mass around it. And then iterated until I got to that final template, um, which is what I've been building. And it's pretty far along. Um, you can see a picture below. And it, it looks kind of small, but it's, it's big. It's shallow, but it's been wide. It can sit between four and five feet in diameter, uh, depending on how much space this is out, and about uh, 3.5 inches deep. The sculpture is made out of a black clay body. Um, it looks brown in the picture, it's just not fired yet. And then I'll use a black metallic ball crawl and soft sculpture on the interior surfaces. So in those voids, um, it'll be sort of like an intricate uh, combination of the ball crawl and the sculpture, which I did bring a sample of the soft sculpture as well. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I have way more content than I have time today, so I won't walk through how I got from A to B to C, but um, uh, through looking at a set of organisms, I looked at um, uh, archaea, a square archaea called Haloquadratum. And the fact that this organism is square is uh, really exceptional. There's really only <laughs> like one or two microbes that we know of that are square. They're typically spherical or um, cylindrical. Um, so that's a really unique organism to the lake. Uh, I also looked at uh, a microalgae called Chinaliella. Uh, it's a primary producer for the lake. It's a really significant organism. I looked at pickleweed, which is a succulent higher plant um, that is extremely salt tolerant. Uh, I also looked at brine shrimp um, and brine fly and yellowfish, which is a sand bacteria a little bit. Um, but I was looking at, again, how are these organisms dealing with the high sea levels of fire? Um, I found a lot of similarities between the organisms. Um, for example, a couple of them, Dinaviella and uh, Rhinship, both produce protective cysts or aponospores, um, which are reproductive genets. Aponospores are just single cellular and cysts are not. Um, but you can think of them like eggs. They're just protective reproductive genets um, that can help uh, the organism survive past times of high stress. Um, a lot of them also produce productive pigments like beta carotene um, or anti desiccation proteins like polyacetylene or glycerol, which are complex um, proteins that are pretty much akin to mucus produced in mammals. Um, and for me, uh, <laughs> I don't have a biology background. I'm coming at this like a complete amateur. So taking the stuff I was reading, taking good notes and then synthesizing it into these uh, research posters was really crucial because for me, like, just taking the step to go figure out what uh, uh, potassium, sodium potassium pump is, was, you know, a lot of effort. So synthesis and then resynthesis into concepts and then eventually into the final diagram you see here. Um, which I'm not gonna explain in depth. Um, at this point, I'm gonna move into uh, one of the pieces which is uh, this branchy thing. And again, um, this is the piece in which I'm focusing on digital fabrication methods. So um, developing a process and developing uh, tools and workflows um, to start to design and fabricate this way. Um, so this was designed in um, Rhino and Blender, a workflow that came to be printed. And from here, the aim was to uh, pass this into uh, biocomposite through mold and pre casting. So I would split this in half, make a mold of this, a two-part mold, uh, and then uh, through a different material, cast this. And my desire was to use a biocomposite that would be made of um, lake matter and waste. Um, so matter, uh, again, relating to assemblage and materiality um, that relates to the lake, so things like Titan, 
beta carotene, alginate, calcium carbonate sourced from eggshell and oyster shell. Um, but I ran into a lot of issues with this material, um, which I have more interact with. So the, the materiality is something that I really enjoyed in this process, but um, there was an issue of fidelity, shrinkage, and um, viscosity pretty much in that um, you can see the differences between these. This is a 3D printed uh, test object pretty much. And then this second thing is a plaster uh, replica. And you can see that pretty much like a one for one. Um, and then this is a oyster shell alginate composite. Um, and you can see like the fidelity, like the details capturing and the shrink rate is like a pretty extreme difference between the plaster. Uh, and I've created quite a challenge in like trying to make this into a biocomposite because it, it branches, uh, it has a lot of thin parts. Um, you can imagine like if this was a two part mold, there'd be a lot of um, vacancies that would be difficult for the material to penetrate. Um, even for plaster, which is a really generic, commonly used um, material. Um, so from here, it's looking like I'll need to redesign the nucleus. Um, and one avenue that I'm really interested in is direct printing of the material piece. Um, the consistency of them is such that it would be really conducive to it. Um, it's just a question of access. And right now I have not had access to a, a, a printer that can print that piece. Yeah. Um, in fact, um, as I said, I have a background in visual arts and I've been working on a body of work for the last two years or so, which this may not look like a lot of work for two years, but the work I do is um, a pretty large scale for the detail that I put into it. Um, and I do a lot of stuff manually. So um, the chair you see at the end there uh, is not CNC'd. I did all of that by hand. Um, and hopefully it's obvious to see some of the things that I'm working with, again, intersections of biology and design and um, art. Uh, I work with motifs like bilateral symmetry, venation, membrane, boundaries, some toys. Um, so this piece fits into the body of work that is in the building. Um, I won't say too much on this slide because I think I'm already over time. Um, but my goal here is to sort of develop a very sensitive materialistic design practice. Um, there's a dichotomy between the two practices that I keep between art and design, I think that are really well summarized by these two quotes. Um, the first is a really famous quote by Victor Schlossky, I think. Um, it says, an art exists that one may recover the sensation of life. It exists to make one feel things, to make the stone stony. And in contrast, the way that Beatrice Palmina and Mark Ridley talk about design, they say, good design is an aesthetic, the smooth surfaces of modern design for living friction, removing bodily and psychological sensation. So my goal is to bring these two things together, to create design that is sensitive and materialistic. And, uh, this project will serve as the base for my thesis next year. The sculpture itself will be a cartoon and concept model for the architecture. So it'll be diagrammatic and conceptually conforming the architecture. The environmental research I did will serve uh, as a basis for a lot of the technical decisions of the architecture. Um, most importantly, processes and um, the program workflows that I've developed. I think you will see um, a really interesting manifestation in things like facade systems, screens, evaporative cooling units, um, and small scale things like furniture, and maybe um, even interspecies chemistry. Thank you guys, and thank you to Digital Matters. <laughs> Um, yes, like everyone, I want to thank you all for being here. It's really fun to hear my colleagues talking about their work that 
I feel really lucky to gotten a little bit of insight over the semester um, as a Digital Matters Fellow. So the project that I want to talk to you about today is my master's thesis. I'm a master's student in environmental humanities and my Digital Matters project was a continuation of a project I've been working on for the last two years um, in collaboration with a nonprofit called Heart Access. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I'll say first, the title of this project, um, which is the Digital Matters component of my project, Digital Ecologies of Access, Archiving Art-Based Narratives at the Intersection of Disability and the Environment in Salt Lake City, Utah. So the project that I worked on this semester was an installation and archive of art that was focused on the intersection of disability and the environment um, based here in Salt Lake City. And as I mentioned, it's part of a larger project that I did with the nonprofit Art Access and 12 artists. Art Access is a Utah-based nonprofit that creates opportunities for disabled artists in the area and also partners with cultural organizations such as museums and um, galleries to improve their accessibility practices. Walk a little bit more on this one. Um, so, together, Art Access and I came up with the idea for a collaborative working group for artists who would create artwork at this intersection of disability and the environment. And the impetus for this project was um, my funding source for my time at the University of Utah comes from a Mellon Foundation grant that's interested in community engaged research that focuses on an aspect of environmental justice for a group that is particularly vulnerable to climate change. Um, so I was really interested in studying the intersection of health and the environment, um, coming to Salt Lake City and knowing about the impact of the Great Salt Lake um, on human health care. And then also as someone who has personal health and disability struggles myself, I've been really interested in this intersection of disability and the environment. Um, first in the literature, both academic um, and more on the political policy side, it's quite widely recognized that this intersection is underrepresented. So even though there are pretty clear connections between health and climate change, um, as well as disability and climate change, we're not talking about this intersection enough. Um, disability communities are at higher risk for um, the impact of climate change and extreme weather events, both because of um, the tendency of people to have pre-existing health conditions and that making them more vulnerable, um, but also, I really want to emphasize that this vulnerability is because of the discrimination that um, disabled communities face because of systems of ableism that prevent disabled folks from having access to resources um, and also from having access to proper disaster response programming or information. Um, and then something that I'm really interested in exploring in my work is the potential of disabled communities to respond to climate change and have um, a sense of agency and um, really important lessons to teach the environmental movement um, about climate resilience and how we need to take care of each other in difficult times. So because disabled communities have for a long time had to figure out ways to survive in antagonistic systems, there are lessons um, that we could learn from practices of community care um, and resistance that are common within disabled communities. And that's an argument that is emerging both from uh, disability advocates and activists within the disability world, but also scholars in fields like disaster studies, sociology, and environmental humanities. So with this project, I was really interested in art um, as a mode to explore the intersection of disability and the environment because art had a strong history within disability um, communities and the disability activist world. Uh, on the slide, I showed Image of Sins and Valid, which is a disability justice art group out of uh, San Francisco that is really at the forefront of sort of collecting and making this ongoing um, history of art within disabled communities more visible to the public. Um, and I also personally, as an artist, I practice filmmaking um, and have an academic background in climate communication. So 
felt really fortunate to be able to put this project together for my master's work that really drew from a lot of my different um, subject interests. So quick summary of the project that I'm working on for these last two years. Um, I partnered with Art Access, uh, not this fall, but the fall before, and they spent a couple months planning the project. Then we were able to put out a call for artists um, and select five artists for the working group. Um, these artists met bi-weekly for that spring and summer um, and put together a body of artwork um, and decided sort of themes. We had really interesting discussions and group meetings. Um, yeah, just trying to build that sort of community care kinship network that I'm so interested in in terms of climate resilience and then also just get really into these personal narratives about environmental health in Salt Lake City. Um, we were able to get additional funding through a SCIF grant here at the University, the Sustainable Campus Initiative Fund, and seven additional artists group joined the group um, in June and were able to meet with the previous group uh, monthly. And then by that fall, we had assembled 24 pieces of art in a wide array of mediums, um, sculpture, painting, uh, textile art, video, um, and all of that art went up into art installations. At first, you can see some images on like, the bottom of that screen. This is at the main branch of the Salt Lake City Public Library. And then we were really fortunate to do our second installation um, here at Digital Matter. So hopefully someone here will to come and see that. I also have one of the art pieces um, here. This was called Woven Lake, and it's a collaboration between the five original working group artists um, and myself and aims to show sort of the change in water levels of the Great Salt Lake. So it's a map representation and then all of the artists contributed relevant materials to that sort of bottom layer. Um, so as a filmmaker, I was taking analog film throughout the process of the project and you can see some of that woven through. One of the artists um, grew up wearing a back brace for her scoliosis and included uh, sort of like a spine sculpture um, that weaves throughout the lake. And the idea of this art piece is really thinking about that necessity of community care and um, collaborative resilience within the face of climate, uh, climate disaster, climate change, um, and thinking about what we need to do together as a collective to respond to that. Um, I also was able to do video interviews with the artists uh, sort of last fall and last winter. And then I was able with my Digital Matters installation, uh, Digital Matters um, Fellowship to put together a digital installation this spring. So being a project focused on disability, we're really interested in making sure that the in-person installations focus on accessibility and were able to be interpreted and appreciated by people with varied abilities. So, for instance, we use painting heights for all the art that were appropriate for wheelchair users. Um, the artists recorded audio um, of visual descriptions of their artwork so that we could link to those with a QR code and folks who aren't able to see the art could hear a description um, of the art. We also included the sensory tables that you see in that picture um, so folks could interact with some of the materials and concepts of the pieces uh, in a tactile manner. Um, we asked people to wear face masks and we also chose successful locations, um, both in the community and on campus that were physically accessible, um, free and frequented by a diverse population. Um, despite that, a physical installation is not accessible to a lot of people, particularly with respect to you know, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, just going out in person to see art is not accessible to everyone. And, in conversations with the artists, many of them were expressing this desire to have a more permanent home for this project and the artwork that they created. Um, so I decided to put together an application to Digital Matters and with the goal of creating a digital installation that would sort of add to the accessibility, um, the potential reach and audience of the project, and then do this archival work of providing a permanent home to the artworks and the narratives um, that we're exploring in the project. With the accessible or with the you know, digital installation, my goal, of course, was also to focus on accessibility. So I wanted to make sure that the website itself was accessible. So while doing this work, 
of making the physical installation more accessible. I also wanted to make sure that the digital installation was accessible to folks with diverse needs. Um, so I don't have a coding or website design background, but spent a ton of time this semester learning about website design and then accessible web design um, for this part of the project. I'm really grateful to everyone at Digital Matters in the library. Um, Rebecca, I worked with um, Rachel Whitman and Anna Nichar, who are the digital installation um, and digital exhibits experts at the library, and then Amanda Crittenden and um, Leah Donaldson, who work on accessibility at the Marriott Library, were super helpful and generous with this part of the project. Um, as I tried to figure out what you need to do technically to make sure that you're creating a digital resource that is um, that incorporates features that allow people with diverse needs and access to technology to perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with the web, as well as contribute to the web. Um, and then sort of adding another layer to the project, I was really interested in moving beyond an approach to accessibility that just focused on compliance and sort of checking off those boxes and towards an understanding of accessibility and web accessibility that was more justice focused. Um, for a quick introduction to these theories, uh, the disability rights movement was really essential for making the case for you know, disabled communities to have legal rights, um, really these like baseline tenets of access. Um, the American, Americans with Disability Acts so or the ADA came out of the disability rights movement, um, really essential in disability history. But in recent years, scholars and activists have moved more towards a disability rights movement, movement and approach, um, or sorry, disability justice movement and approach, which focuses on intersectionality and really recognizes that the disability rights movement by taking um, a single sphere approach and just focusing on disability really leaves out folks who have intersecting um, identities that are impacting their experience in the world. So disabled people of color and disabled queer and trans folks, for example, um, and through those different approaches to disability emerged two really different approaches to access, um, where the disability rights movement has an understanding of access that's really about the individual and removing barriers to make the individual um, experience more accessible. Um, the disability justice movement is more interested in an idea of access that is collective and ongoing and recognizing that all people and all bodies have diverse needs um, that deserve to be met and that the responsibility of meeting those is more about systemic change and um, collective action than about this sort of individual practice of accommodation. So this is sort of the framework I went into my website design with. Um, I, as I mentioned, had to do a ton of research on accessible web design. Um, I learned how to use a screen reader and the personal tests of the website that I was developing um, and just sort of learned all the technical skills and then was able to go in and think about um, what I could do with the specific design choices to really get that more justice focus um, to the accessibility standards that I was including. Um, I don't have time to go through all of these. So what I have done um, is including a QR code at the end. I'm hoping everyone has a chance to explore the website. But um, one example I want to point to is the last bullet point visual descriptions. Um, this was something that we included in the in-person installations that the artists recorded their own descriptions of the artwork. And I really wanted to make sure that that was on the website so that um, there's just that more personal touch and thinking about a justice framework of access also means prioritizing people who are often left out um, most intensely. So art being such a visual medium, it was really important to myself, the artist, art access to center people who are engaging with the artwork through a sense other than sight. So those personal visual descriptions from the artist allow us to access that type of um, ephemeral nature of art and that aspect of art that really is beyond just um, you know, sort of inexplicable and hard to describe, but hearing an artist talk about their own work hopefully allows you to access a little bit more of that, um, yeah, emotional side of the artwork and of access. Um, 
what's next for the project. I'm hoping to sort of finish adding to the website in the next couple of weeks. We have a pretty, um, it's pretty complete, but I still have a little bit more I'd like to do with it. And then I also want to produce a documentary out of the footage that I was able to capture throughout the project, um, including the interviews with the artists. Um, the contributions of the project uh, at the University of Utah, some of the things that I noticed when building the installation um, on the digital platform that I used, which was Omeka S, um, and my conversations with the accessibility folks at the library have led to um, advancements in the accessibility practices at the library, which I'm really excited about. And in my overall hope with this is that it sort of continues to ripple out and we are able to build more towards a culture of access at the university that's more comprehensive and more justice focused. Um, at Art Access, the program that we built through the environment or the Embodied Ecologies Project um, is now part of their annual programming. So it's one of their two core programs. Um, and I was able to sort of create a, a system for running that program over the last semester that they can now reproduce and repeat every year. Um, and then also within the scholarly conversation, this is a case study for projects that are working in environmental humanities and critical disability studies um, and community engaged methodologies um, in general. Um, yeah, so hopefully if people have devices that are able to, you can scan there and get to the website. <laughs> Um, so my name is Eliana Massey. I am an undergraduate intern with Digital Matters, and the topic uh, or the title for my presentation today is Nurturing Kin-Centric Digital Ecologies. And the term kin-centric ecology, as far as I'm aware, um, was coined by um, one of the leading scholars of traditional ecological knowledge, um, Dr. Enrique Samuel, who is Indigenous. Um, and this concept is basically that human life is not viable if we do not view and act like we are a part of a larger ecological family that includes more than human kin. Um, and that, you know, the way that we conceptualize of our relationship to other forms of life is important for the flourishing of the entire ecosystem. And the term digital ecology refers to uh, the relationship between technology and the environment um, and how these things interact. Um, and a lot of research in digital ecology focuses on negative interactions, for example, data pollution. Um, but I want to explore in this presentation some of the possibilities for positive interactions um, and I think that Indigenous studies um, and Indigenous conceptions of ecology really have valuable things to offer to the field of digital ecology. So first I want to talk a little bit about my process. Um, I began this project by reaching out to the director of the Pacific Island Studies Program here at the Real, um, Dr. Miley Arvin. And um, I did this because uh, recently the Pacific Island Studies Program at the U received a major Mellon grant um, to help create a center for Pacifica and Indigenous Knowledges, um, which would be one of the first um, kinds of centers in the United States. Um, and also I have Kanaka um, ancestry or Native Hawaiian ancestry. And so I was just interested in you know, ways that I could learn more and um, support this program through my digital matters internship. Um, and so I reached out and um, the beginning of this process was really just establishing a relationship and um, trying to figure out you know, what needs and interests um, that program and community had. 
Um, and it ended up being the case that, you know, there were various needs and interests. Um, and so it seems like the best thing to do would be to do a little bit more research into previous um, applications at the intersection of Indigenous studies and digital humanities. Um, I think that often in community-based projects, specifically in digital humanities, um, they can be a little unique because, you know, communities know their needs and their interests, um, but they might not know all the technological possibilities. And so I think that it's good to um, do very careful research and to present those options and possibilities to them and allow them the choice. Um, so that's what I did. And I um, am going to share in future slides some of the resources that I found um, at this intersection of Indigenous Studies and Digital Humanities. Um, but the next step in this process was generating ideas um, based on the research that I did and also based on the needs and interests of the Pacific Island Studies Program. And then I worked with um, the Pacific Island Studies Program to prioritize a couple ideas. And then from there on, I've been working on those projects, um, which has mostly involved a lot of um, community engagement, a lot of coordination with different groups and people. Um, and then I have another arrow because this project is very much so continuing. <laughs> um, um, so I have some pictures up here of a couple um, different creative scholarships that I reviewed. That's at the intersection of Indigenous Studies and Digital Humanities. Um, there's this book, A Digital Bundle. Um, I read this book. There's also this platform um, referred to. It's a content management system um, that was designed uh, to help um, Indigenous communities manage and share their digital cultural heritage. Um, kind of as Ali uh, mentioned earlier today, you know, there's, there's specific uh, there's specific restrictions on different knowledge within Indigenous communities and often um, content management systems or different archival systems uh, that are existing don't have the capacity to um, carefully uh, archive those things and share them with different communities. And so this content manage management system was designed specifically um, to be able to create that access and that control for Indigenous communities of their own cultural heritage. And then there's also this program, Voices of the Land. Um, this platform uh, is focused on sharing stories from different Indigenous groups in Alberta, Canada. Um, and they've organized it based on different topics, as well as communities. They have collections that include uh, digitized objects, as well as world history interviews and different resources to learn more. Um, uh, the Center for Digital Humanities at Princeton has a list of resources um, related to Indigenous digital humanities. That was a really helpful resource. I reviewed um, basically everything on there that seemed relevant and that I had access to. Um, there's also this um, platform, Native Land Digital. I think this might be the most well-known Indigenous um, digital humanities platform. At least in my social media circles, I see people share this all the time on like Thanksgiving or whatnot. Um, but it's a really helpful resource because it helps you to see um, what Indigenous groups live, um, where you are, you know, what languages are Indigenous to that place, learn a little bit more about the history through um, learning more about treaties and different stuff like that. Um, it's very interactive. It's excellent. Um, and then UCLA also uh, has a program called Mapping Indigenous LA, um, which they've created various story maps um, to sort of tell the story through um, our GIS's story map program of different Indigenous communities in LA. Um, and then there's another book uh, which isn't specifically um, related to uh, digital humanities, but this book um, was very influential in the way that I thought about um, these projects and is also very related to um, the concept of king-centric technology. Um, so one thing you might have noticed is that many indigenous digital humanities projects are GIS focused. Um, and 
in some ways, you know, this has to do with the way that cartography um, has been a tool of conversation and sort of critiquing that. Um, but there are plenty of different explanations for why this is. And one that I find pretty compelling um, comes from an indigenous scholar. Um, and he makes this argument that uh, topos, as in like topography or place, is foundational to indigenous epistemologies in a similar way to how Western epistemology is built upon logos or discourse. And I thought that was really interesting to think about this difference between word and place um, and think about how these um, origin points change kind of the trajectory of these different epistemologies and how this might change uh, in effect research methodologies themselves as, where, as well as, you know, thinking about you know, how do we design an interactive project so that people can, um, people can use it in ways that make sense to them. Um, so I'm gonna get next to sort of the, the projects that I um, ended up prioritizing out of the different ideas, which were two different projects. Um, so the first one was, um, creating an ArcGIS story map for Pacific Islander students at the U that locates Pacific Islander faculty and staff and resources. Um, and some of the reasons why we wanted to work on this project um, is that you know, this is a potentially helpful resource for a website for a future center for Pacific and indigenous knowledges. And also um, sort of related to what Natalie was talking about, about this idea of you know, maybe going the extra mile sometimes and having Resources that are intimate for communities that are often overlooked is important. Um, and Pacific Islander students are definitely um, an overlooked student population. Here. Um, and then the second project that I'm working on, which is um, similar in terms of methods at least, um, is creating an ArcGIS story map that highlights three local indigenous and Pacifica community gardens and their efforts related to food sovereignty, land sovereignty, and indigenous and Pacifica well-being in general. Um, and the goals for this project, um, I feel like have kind of been evolving over time in some ways, but some of the main goals um, are to strengthen these relationships between uh, the Pacific Island Studies Program and these community partners, um, also to strengthen the relationships between the gardens, and then also to raise awareness about supporting local indigenous community organizing um, because, you know, these, these activists need help, these community organizers need support. Um, often their work is undermined or, you know, the resources that they have are um, not, uh, you know, they're finite. And so, you know, it's important that the larger community, you know, is aware of the importance of this and realizes that, you know, these big conversations like, you know, land sovereignty and stuff like that, that are, you know, uh, some people might seem intellectual, are really embodied and they are located in this place where we live. Um, so this is what um, the current, like, beginning of the um, first project looks like in story maps. Um, and I want to show you an example of uh, sort of what it looks like with locating different um, faculty and staff and resources at the U. So here is um, one professor who works at the U, also trying to create buttons um, as well as, you know, letting people know where they are. And then uh, I also have um, shared different questions that I created with different Pacific Islander faculty and staff at the U, um, trying to create more warmth in this, um, faculty profiles um, are kind of sterile. Um, and so I wanted to create this like specifically as a resource to kind of relate um, to these different potential mentors. And, um, and then here you can kind of see an example of you know, what some of those answers to those questions look like. Um, And then I've also tried to find different resources that exist at you, but might 
might be kind of hidden in some ways um, and highlight them through this story map. Uh, one of those resources is there's the Pacific Islander Oral History um, Project at the Marriott Library. And so I went through and kind of uh, was looking for different themes and pulling out some different quotes from different oral histories. And I think I'm gonna highlight a couple of those quotes and some of those themes, um, especially relating to education um, and these different people's experiences. Um, and also, you know, provide, you know, links to this so that, you know, people want to do research on, you know, Pacific Islanders in Utah, then this resource is available to them. I've also been working on creating, um, like highlighting some different books um, related to uh, Pacific Islander scholarship and literature that are at the Marriott Library. So people can kind of um, get an idea of, you know, what exists out there. Um, this is a book that's very significant in Pacific Island studies, specifically Hawaiian studies. Um, and I think that, you know, many people have very powerful experiences, you know, when they read a book where they see themselves represented or they understand more about the context of their culture and their family. And so I think that, you know, that's a valuable research to share today. And then switching gears a little bit, I want to just briefly talk about some of the um, Indigenous and Pacific Community Gardens that um, I've been partnering with. It's these three organizations. Um, and we've been working on trying to figure out, you know, the best way to integrate their stories and their efforts into a story map. Um, right now we're thinking, you know, integrating, you know, some written as well as audio um, interviews, also some video interviews, hopefully. Um, I've also been thinking about, you know, how to try to make it feel atmospheric, um, maybe thinking about adding like recorded bird song or something like that to different parts of um, the story map. Also thinking about different ways that people might want to express their thoughts and feelings about these topics. So, you know, giving the option to express it through sharing art or through sharing a recipe or something like that. Um, and so this project is really just beginning in some ways, but I'm very excited to continue it. Um, and I wanted to just highlight this really quickly. Um, the Ogwai Garden, which is one of um, the gardens that I've been working with um, recently has been uh, struggling because uh, the, the city wanted to basically destroy the garden, but it appears like that will hopefully not happen through a partnership with another community garden. But I think that this just highlights um, some of what I was getting at earlier in terms of how um, ephemeral these uh, projects can be um, because there isn't enough support for them. Um, but it also highlights the ways that, you know, when people recognize the importance of these things, um, decisions can be changed. Um, and it can, you know, end up even being a good thing and lead to more collaboration in some ways, as well as more awareness about the issues that we face. And so I wanted to close with this quote from Robin, from Robin Wall Miller, um, who's actually coming to the U to give a chance to manage this talk. Go with me soon. Um, and she says, action on behalf of life transforms. Because the relationship between self and the world is reciprocal, it is not a question of first getting enlightened or saved and then acting. As we work to heal the earth, the earth heals us. And I thought that was just a beautiful encapsulation of this idea of human-centric ecology. Um, and I'm excited to keep exploring uh, the ways that human-centric ecology relates to digital ecology and the ways that these two um, ideas can support each other. Um, and then I just finally have some acknowledgments, um, which a lot of the people that I'm grateful for that have helped on this project. That's it. Thank you so much to all of our presenters. That was amazing. Um, 
it just really struck me this is one of the few places you can go and hear from faculty and graduate students and undergraduate students in this like 90 minute block of time and I just think it's really incredible to hear it all together. We have about 10 minutes for questions. So what's burning in your mind to ask our presenters? Uh, thank, thank you, everyone, for your presentation about the law. Um, Eric, I had a question for you. Uh, maybe I missed it, or um, I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit more about sort of the digital nature of your project. Mm -hmm. I thought the content of your project is really compelling. Mm -hmm. uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. I'm just curious if you thought about digital methods or digital education. Like, what's, I mean, coming from the humanities, it's rat. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, in that regard, uh, you know, I haven't figured out a way to go beyond the very rudimentary graph making um, in terms of visualization. But if there are other ideas that you have, you know, going forward. I would very much be open to, um, you know, you know, learning other ways to present the kind of data that that I'll address. Yeah, I mean, just off the top, I mean, I don't know how how specific geographically your data gets. The, the charts that you presented, right? But just having like a, a you could do sort of geographies of like um, carbon emissions over time and, mm -hmm. and like you know show like where that makes sort of two transitions and then say, but like ah, if it gets that specific, then that could really inform, right? Okay, yeah. but uh, yeah. if it doesn't get that specific, then that would be, yeah. I mean, there's definitely space and time are, are in there, uh, but I mean, it's. Yeah, so I would be, yeah, I'm very interested in how it would be if it's stat, you know, static for the publication of an article or a book. Um, that would be great. Yeah, I think that's all Thanks. Thanks very much, everybody, for your presentation. But um, I'll pass to the next uh, yeah, since it's very much exciting. Um, my question is for Lori. I was struck by this idea of fidelity. Sort of the loss of fidelity in trying to use the dynamic models. Um, can you talk about the desire for fidelity? Like, you know, is, is there a possibility that that change, that loss, could be a positive thing, or, or is the fidelity a crucial component? Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's open to loss. The, um, the reason I chose to use fidelity is that that is something. Um, so I'm always in the law, the, the thinking thing comes with the digital picture. Um, my digital model is extremely exciting. Um, in that uh, I have at least in our law team, um, uh, um, so I was actually thinking that it's like around um, in the branches. So you can imagine like, if I have something shrinking and not like maintaining that surface, like that's problematic for the design. Um, so I kind of have like two avenues there, but I embrace the you know, the design composite, um, like a uh, design ability, or I choose to make the Um But I, the, the oyster composite that I cast, I really like it. Um, I think it looks a lot like sort of like, like um, almost like a shimmering. Um, but yeah, uh, it's one of the reasons that like I I application, especially in the symmetry. Um, it's obvious that like, symmetry is something I work with a lot. Um, and I find it's a way to like parse some of the um, interaction between like violet light and violet light. Um, a lot of my work deals with sort of putting those windows and like how between um, organic things and organic matter are really are taken from their context become really like solid. Um, so like Exact symmetries for like a space property becomes like monolithic and something that can like be set on a movie. Um, so, like, digital matter is a big one. Yeah, I think that's all. One more question. Yeah. 
that kind of going off of that idea, don't worry. I was struck by your use of symmetry, um, just because when I think of biology, I think in a lot of ways it's communicated to us in a way that it's perfect. And it and that these things are symmetrical, but when we actually go out into the world, we realize that it's not. And the biology is really messy. Um, so can you, yeah, can you just speak to that more about your choice of symmetry, although you do focus on biology and work? Yeah. Um, well, symmetry is like a really important tool. We're not cool, I do that. But like when life sort of stumbles in, like the vision of symmetry, um, like back up and doing something done. So for me, like symmetry is a way to reference like macroorganisms uh, in my work and to think about like the work itself as an organism, or like just the way you see it kind of work. Um, so like symmetry is really linked to large scale organisms, um, but yet it's not perfect. And if you look at my business, it's never perfect. You play with the chair, it's not perfect. And that's why I made it by hand. And you can see it today. Um, my desire to push the perfect symmetry is like I was saying earlier, it's um, a lot of my work has been on the side of um, beauty and um, sensitivity and like idea. Um, but I'm feeling more compelled by like um, when like natural things are scary and why they're scary to us. Um, I think that's an acute problem um, as a work for me. I'm really compelled by by where symmetry comes in because again, like perfect symmetry is unnatural. Um, and so like sort of like using uh, unsettling nature of the way that I'm exploring symmetry. I have a question burning, so I'm gonna do take privilege here and ask Ali directly. Um I'm so taken with your work, and I think it's so important. And how do we create these access points to collections that weren't probably described in ways that provided access when they were collected? But the question is, like, you were able to do 60 records as part of this, you know, this like pilot project. So two parts: how does it scale, and what do you see as being the limits of automation if automation is needed? Good question. Um, so I think, and I hope you scratched my presentation that the labor that goes into the archive is massive and often completely limited, often by the money um, and to our detriment. Um, but uh, one of the things we hope to accomplish with having this pilot set of records um, is to buff up the statistics about training um, and how long it takes um, to be able to learn to do this work and then use that to apply for additional grants. Um, so that I can get a longer term worker for two or two years perhaps um, to develop more of the expertise over time um, and be able to enhance more of these records. Um, and without that additional labor, there's just no way to do this. Um, and I think automation really is not possible for a lot of people. Um, you know, we talk about things like OCR, which is very easy to apply to print. If you're talking to like Kendrick and Justin, it's even from a couple of decades or maybe a century or two ago, like it can get not starter. It can be really not feasible to get to this. You have to have a person who's creating these domains and having a lot of other skills to be doing this labor. Um, and that's the thing. When you have photographs, when you have um, reality, you know, like actual objects, um, you know, I think there's a huge limit in what a computer or any other human can do to be so parsable. And even if they can describe a single object, I think putting it together in context with all the other materials plus the archive as a whole is really where you can get into this knowledge and this embracing and using the ability to make connections between different things. That really shines here in a way that the dual technology can only match by this content. Yeah, that's a great question. I wonder if that would be the answer, but <laughs> 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 we probably have time for one more question. Does anyone have one last burning question for our panel? Okay. If not, then I did want to just make one announcement that um, we have an annual digital humanities symposium that we've been doing for eight years now. And University of Utah is going to be hosting 
the 2024 Digital Humanities Utah Symposium. I was just going to encourage everyone to keep your eyes out for that call for proposals. If you have something work in progress or if you want to update us on how your projects are going then. Um, I do have just small gifts for our, our students today. Um, I'm so appreciative of the work that you've all done in the lab this semester. This really has been an incredible group that's probably made me um, reflect and every on things more than I ever had in the past. Um, actually, your names are on them, but I don't know who to speak, so I'm just going to put them here for now. <laughs> and one is for Ashton as well, our fall 2022 fellow who is graduating or has graduated but is walking next to you. So thank you everyone for being here. Let's give our families one more round of applause. I just want to say, well, I'm Kevin Collins. Nice to meet know. you. Yeah, I got your email today. I'll, I'll get type on that soon. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> nice, to nice to meet you, too. Yeah. <laughs> 